Welcome to Answers in First Enoch, episode 15. We are continuing in the realm of the geography of Enoch still, in which this appears to further affirm the previous videos yet again. The archangel Raphael is instructed by Yahuwah to bind the leader of the watchers, Azazel, or some would say Azazel, and cast him into the pit, Tartarus, Gehenna, the chamber within the earth that serves as the prison where these fallen angels await their judgment of on the final day of judgment with everything else. But where is this? Can we locate it? Well, this is another mind-blowing video where Enoch does exactly that. Enoch is just going to make your toes curl here. And for those that wonder, by the way, um, when we especially say something uh, where we're rebuking scholars, which we do often and we'll continue to do, um, understand we're rebuking them in the context that they throw this book out Yet we're able to prove this as scripture. We're able to prove the historicity of this all the way back to it being written by Enoch, used by Enoch, taught by Enoch, taught by Methuselah, taught by Lamech, taught by Noah, and taught all the way uh, to Noah's death and to Abraham. When you have that and any scholar just ignores this, especially geography, right? I mean, this is written geography. You can call it whatever you want. Okay, so maybe they don't like what Enoch has to say about theology. You know what? That's hypocritical of academia and scholarship. Because the reality is, they uh, will use anything else. And I mean anything else that they find and propagate its even religious views, they're okay with that, except if it's the Bible or something associated with the Bible paradigm, which Enoch proves to be the origin of much within the Bible. Anyway, get ready, because this is going to take off now. Again, Enoch's geography is clear and precise and can't really be debated, period. Uh, he goes to the desert of Arabia, where Mount Sinai is. Uh, just so you know, that's already east of Africa. Then he treks to the east, so he's even further east of Africa. Oh, he's also east of Israel. Therefore, they are not the Garden of Eden. Duh. To the great Indian desert, further east to the land of cinnamon, which is Sri Lanka, or no further than Myanmar in the definition uh, of the, the Latin, true cinnamon, the words in Latin literally say that. Then further east to the spice islands of Malaysia and Indonesia. Folks, we are not in India. We are not in Africa. We are not in Mesopotamia. We are not in Israel. These people have no clue of biblical geography. And we call them dunderheads. Yes, scholars. I know some are following scholarly babble and propagating it and trying to debate it and argue it. Of course. Well, if you're following ignorance and we call it ignorance, it's ignorance because it's ignorance. Quit following it. You can learn. It's okay. So, here we go now. Uh, he says, at that point, the East Indies, essentially, uh, that he's at the Eurythian Sea, uh, the Indian Ocean, where it ends on the east side of it, and he exits it. And indeed, it does geographically, by the way. Anybody who can read a map can see that. Yeah, I know. I know scholars can't read a map, it appears. Then he heads northeast to the Garden of Eden. Boom. Which geography fits one land on all of Earth? It's called the Philippines. That's a large stretch of islands, uh, 7,000 islands in total, uh, that really stretch all the way from just southeast of China all the way down uh, to uh, Malaysia. So that is, uh, even though a lot of the islands are small, that is actually a, a pretty massive archipelago in footprint when you think about it. And Luzon actually is one of the larger islands on Earth. Not the largest, but one of. However, there's no other options here. There's nothing, absolutely 
Nothing. You can't be in Malaysia and head northeast and still be in Malaysia, number one. You can't be in Malaysia and head northeast and be in Indonesia. You can't be in Malaysia and head northeast and be in Japan. You can't be in Malaysia and head northeast and be in China. I mean, these are, these are illiterate guesses from many out there, and they're all over the map. Uh, even if you go from there northeast and try to make it to South America, you won't because it will go up, you know, far north beyond that. Um, you know, and again, you've already passed all of the places, all of the places who are making claims that they are au fear. Again, let's be clear, though, they're not actually making that. It's all the British. It's all British propaganda. And we prove that out in our book, The Search for King Solomon's Treasure. All of this is detailed there very well. Now, Noah used Enoch's geography in mapping the entire earth and his division between his three sons. Just going back to foundation here, and then we'll get going. Uh, which we map out geographically in the Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar, uh, available free in ebook, or also you can purchase in print if you wish at bookofjubilees.org. It's there. Uh, Noah defines the Garden of Eden there for multiple directions, even affirming his own directions multiple times. Really, these serve as the two oldest maps between Enoch and Jubilees of all of Earth. Uh, Jubilees is far more extensive and really covers the entire Earth, whereas Enoch uh, somewhat segments of it, though, though he will show you the shape of the earth we'll get to. Uh, basically, uh, the Garden of Eden, according to Noah, according to Jubilees, according to Moses and the angel of the presence who actually kept this record and gave it to Moses, but originally written by Noah, right? So, you know, all of these things that say, oh, well, you know, the Bible, uh, you know, it, it uh, plagiarizes uh, occult Nephilim myth. Yeah, right. That's so stupid. And those are proven stupid. We, we went into that some more in the last video. So, but just as Enoch here, um, Shem's territory goes to the far east, um, the same group of islands, very same, uh, and they serve as his eastern border as well as southeastern border. Now, I don't know about you, but if anybody looks at a map that ain't Africa. It can't be, because uh, that's way back west of Saudi Arabia before Enoch began most of this journey. So, duh, uh, he headed east, and then 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 he headed east from the beginning Saudi Arabia in that part of the world. So, I, I don't, I mean, it's incoherent that there are so many out there. So, you know, oh, it's Africa. No, it's not. Oh, it's Mesopotamia. That's the occult legend, uh, which stupid scholars do prop propagate, uh, just as they do with the Ark landing. We cover that in Where Did Noah's Ark Land? And oops, did Ron Wyatt find the Nephilim Ark? Yes, in fact, he did. Uh, at least the legend. He goes to that border, defined as the Mountains of Fire, which is Ganung Ganung Api, mountains, Ganung Ganung Api Fire, in Javanese, still named that to this day, uh, and Noah set them as the border. A little space north of that is, Noah says, the Garden of Eden. Now, he used to live there in that same land, right? And so did Enoch. So these two guys aren't just speculating. They're experts. This was their homeland. They knew exactly where it was, and stupid Pharisees, throw this out. Modern scholars, throw this out. And yes, we will rebuke them often for such ignorance. It is total ignorance. They haven't tested these books at all in the slightest. They don't even understand the Qumran narrative. They say, oh, Essenes live there. That is the dumbest line I've ever heard. We've well proven that. Go back and watch our original canon series. This is also the Philippines uh, against the, uh, basically the Garden of Eden is within the earth, okay? It's not up here on the surface as Gan, the Hebrew word right there in Genesis, uh, is, uh, has two meanings, enclosure and garden. Uh, yes, it is the planting of a garden indeed, but it is an enclosed garden. It's both. Uh, it has one entrance, which is why the angels were only placed on the east side of the garden. 
not the north, south, west, or even above. Seems like we need to mention that every video because if we don't, we get comments. So, there. Uh, it is enclosed within the earth below the surface we see. Uh, it was not destroyed as the notion that Yahuwah would destroy his own holy of holies on earth since creation. I mean, how ridiculous. But watch, is the garden still there? And we prove that out in scripture. Uh, don't watch, don't try to argue. Uh, also, watch where did Enoch go as he resides in the Garden of Eden to this very day, because the garden's still there until the day of final judgment in that very narrative. Uh, and that ain't happened yet. Uh, this is why Revelation still places the garden there physically, and the tree of life still in the midst of the garden physically in the end times. Still there. So try to debate that here, though, without watching those. You will be muted. Our channel, our rules. Last video, we covered Duda'in, or Duda'in, the land east of the garden, where Adam and Eve were exiled, also known as Havila. It's the same place, uh, which is really the entire archipelago, Havila, and Duda'in, really a place a region within where the elect and righteous generations of Adam dwell. Not Cain, he wasn't righteous, and he migrated east away from there. Yes, this is not a mystery and has always been known by the ancients. We've just lost it, thanks to scholars in modern times. Just not by modern scholars. They don't get it at all because they throw this out, and they know very little of the Bible, we have proven, unfortunately, what they know is they know their paradigms they've been programmed into, and those are infused with Pharisee leaven, which has been exposed on this channel many times. Uh, and even the occult, uh, outright, <laughs> outright in the case of the flood, uh, outright in, in the case of the Garden of Eden. I mean, these are ridiculous uh, notions that a modern scholar would propagate the occult. Yet they do, whether they realize it or not. And the unfortunate thing is, they're so uninformed on the topic, they likely do not even know they do it. Well, we've proven they do. They demonstrate a complete lacking in the area of research. That's the problem. And reading comprehension is a real challenge uh, regarding the Bible for them because, again, they're stuck in a paradigm and they can't see outside of that box. Everything they look at has, you know, they have glasses and that lens is made to obscure any kind of basic understanding of even simple sentences many times that are very direct and anyone could just read and understand, but they have to take that into all kinds of directions. No thank you. This is where Enoch was taken up because he is the seventh from Adam and lived where Adam lived. And remember Noah wrote this proving he also still lived in this same land until the flood. This land is very clearly identified by Enoch in very exact directions as the modern Philippines, period. No one can disprove that. No one has in over five years since we found it. Again, Noah didn't leave us to guess either, as he clarifies later in the chapter that all he had been saying here in this chapter, he saw geographically, yes, physically, near the physical garden of Eden, which is a physical garden in a physical place with physical fruit that man ate. I mean, I don't know how anyone can misread all of those very direct narratives in Scripture, yet they do, and they do over and over, and they try to take all of those and turn them into, oh, well, that's allegory. No, the, the fruit wasn't actually fruit. It was... Whatever comes after that is stupid, period. It just is. I mean, the Hebrew word for fruit is fruit. That's what it is, and that's what it was. Uh, the Bible says it was. The Bible says it was a tree that you eat of. I mean, you know, all of those things, all of those narratives are so straightforward that only a moron could misunderstand the plain, in this case, English, but even the Hebrew. Uh, they're supposedly Hebrew scholars that don't even understand Hebrew. Watch that video if you have not. Um, try to debate the last video. Uh, try to debate on this video about the last video. Well, don't even try it. Uh, no debate in ignorance here. Uh, this is our channel. 
abide by our rules. Now, one of our viewers in Israel, a Hebrew-speaking viewer, Filipino OFW, uh, Yachtin B17, who is full of wisdom, especially in connecting the Hebrew language, uh, which he well knows, even on a practical level, he speaks it. Okay, so understand that. Yes, ancient Hebrew is different, and he knows that. He said that many times, and he doesn't just go by what he knows of modern Hebrew, but he has that context. He goes back into the ancient Hebrew, and he clearly applies that restored, and that's what he's doing uh, here. Regarding Dudain of Enoch, and this is fascinating, uh, and we encourage you, read his comments whenever you see them, because he's, he's very good, uh, and it affirms what we're teaching. Where the righteous of Adam dwelled before the flood, okay, due to Eden, he connects the Hebrew word for beloved, the first part, and the isles. Beloved isles. Imagine that. Talk about a fit. Now, we love hearing from our friend because, you know, he is he's awesome. His comments connect. Uh, even other scriptures here, as you see, uh, in the Hebrew, in use, so you can see how well it's put together. He spends a lot of time on that, obviously, and this is incredible. Uh, you, you'll see him comment. Again, read his comments because they are very good. Now, this makes sense, and we are going to take you to the Hebrew for this next place as well, which we find connected. The place where Raphael opened the earth, and this is cool. Right, I mean, this is this is what, especially those of us that love action movies, right? You can picture the action on this one. Raphael opens the earth, wow, and cast is Zazel as Azel, the basically leader of the Watchers, at least uh, who started the whole thing, into the lowest hell or Tartarus from above the surface. Imagine that. I mean. He bored a deep pit into the earth, directly down there, and he threw him down. I mean, wow, this is awesome, and this is going to be really good. Uh, this is where all the fallen angels are imprisoned to this day. Let's be clear. Open your book of First Enoch to chapter 10, verse 4. And again, Yahuwah said to Raphael. Now, we know he is one of the seven archangels we covered earlier in this series, so go back and watch that if you have not. Bind Azazel, the leader of the watcher fallen angels, essentially, hand and foot, and cast him into the darkness, and make an opening in the desert, the wilderness. Hmm, where might that be? Uh, which is in Dudael. Hmm. Now that sounds familiar. What is that and where is it? We're going to locate it as best we can in this video. It's not going to be as scientific as the last one, which is very direct and very obvious. Uh, this is not as obvious, but the connection is there nonetheless. And cast him there in and place upon him rough and jagged rocks, and cover him with darkness, and let him abide there forever, and cover his face, that he may not see light. Understand that the fallen angel prison, yes, the lake of fire is there. They're not thrown into that yet, but they get to watch the doom that's, that's coming, right? They can watch what will be their judgment. Uh, and that has to be uh, the, the, the worst of torments, if you were an angel especially, who was well aware. He knew they would know exactly uh, what, that, what that represented. Um, but it describes it, uh, the Bible describes it as being a place of darkness as well. So, yeah, the lake of fire is there, and there is light there as a result of the lake of fire, I'm sure. But it is a place of darkness as well. Verse 6. And on the day of the great judgment, when's that? We know that's the final judgment. It's not the flood because he's being thrown there in there during the flood. So it can't be the flood. So and on that day of the great judgments, he's imprisoned. He's awaiting his 
judgment is trial, and then the judgment will be executed. How? He shall be cast into the fire. Now, then he'll go into the lake of fire, and that's how that works. So notice the opening is made up here on the surface. It's not an opening in the lowest hell. It will go there, but he's going to drill down through the earth all the way down. The question is, are these geological markers or figures, or is this a place that can be identified? We believe that it can, and we'll go there. Now, some scholars try to connect Dudael to Tartarus specifically, or Gihana. No, it leads there because the angel opened the earth at Dudael, right? Which he didn't open into Tartarus. That's way down below in the bottom of what we call hell, uh, but hell is really Sheol in Hebrew, it's Hades in Greek, it really just means the underworld, and most of hell is not burning and not evil. Uh, there's a lot of hell that is very good, like the Garden of Eden, um, in terms of Sheol and Hades, the actual words used. Uh, one of the worst justices that translators did was taking those different words, Tartarus, Gihana, um, you know, uh, Sheol, uh, Hades, and, and equating all of them, and they just can't be equated. That's, that's ridiculous. Uh, and, you know, they do it throughout Scripture, and it confuses everyone as to what that word, which again is interpreted as hell, means, because it has different meanings when it's used depending on the actual original word. So, it will be at its end right? This is where Tartarus is. All the way down at the bottom, you know, he's going to drill a pit that goes all the way down into the earth to the end, which is a monumental task if you think about it. Not something you or I could do, not something modern technology can do to this day. The furthest they've been able to drill into the earth is seven and a half miles. That's nothing. Uh, and that's why they have no clue about what is in the interior of the earth. They found water flowing through rock. That's what science observes. Not a magma core, which science doesn't observe, but is made up fiction. So there you go. So this is the place here on earth, on the surface, okay, where that pit was dug, basically. So yes, he will be cast all the way down. So this is a major pit, not a minor one. Uh, so what did Raphael do here? He made or drilled an opening in the earth, basically, at a point that can be identified. Again, not as scientifically as our previous videos, even in the series, but still the connection is there. Uh, that is significant, we believe, we'll locate it. Um, so check this out. Uh, also note, Azazel cannot escape. He doesn't escape. Uh, no watcher, fallen angel, does. He's never released. He is there imprisoned. Till when? Read what the words say. Enoch tells you, awaiting the day of final judgment, period. That's it. Done. And at that point, he's going to be judged and cast into the fire. It's done. I mean, he this... This fallen angel has no more future. It's already determined. It's done. Okay. Uh, again, he's imprisoned, awaiting judgment, but his judgment is firm. We know what it is and what it's going to be. Now, when we look at this Hebrew word, duda el, the word dude, right? <laughs> no. Uh, but the, the beginning of the word, dud, uh, dude, however you pronounce it, uh, is defined as a pot, jar, or deeper in meaning, and better, really, in Strong's exhaustive concordance here, cauldron. What's that? Well, that's a, a, a usually, I mean, you picture a burning fire, you know, a, under a cauldron, and it makes sense. Uh, kettle, or seething pot, all three of those really the same. Uh, in connotation. That fits this imagery perfectly as Azazel is cast into Tartarus, though not into the lake of fire yet. He's on the sides, uh, right next to it, where he can face his impending doom 
daily the ultimate torture for a fallen angel. He is in prison there and will never, ever escape, period, not one hour, not one minute. No one will ever talk to him. No one will communicate with him. He doesn't have telepathy that goes beyond there. There is nothing. He is nothing and never will be again. Get that. Now, basically, this is a cauldron, boiling pot of sort of El or Elohim, really. No, not a Canaanite deity as some try to claim, which is complete fraud and a misreading. Um, the word Elohim is simply a classification of all heavenly beings. Angels are called Elohim in Scripture. It's there many times. Uh, so basically, this is the cauldron of the fallen angels. That would be the accurate way to define this, and it's right there in the Word. Wow. Back to our chart we explained previously. Watch parts uh, 5 and 6 if you have not. We explained this there. Don't try to debate us here. Uh, what we call hell in translation is multiple words, and that leads to misunderstanding. Uh, this is why we rebuke translators, because they do these kinds of things, and it is gross negligence. It is something that uh, should not have ever happened. I mean, they're supposed to be able to read and understand Hebrew words yet uh, and Greek, uh, but yet they, they seemingly didn't, and that is not true. They were smart guys, and they knew better, but they did it anyway because they were propagating a paradigm, infusing it into the Bible so that you and I would read it that way. That's called fraud. That's what it is, and the translators are guilty and caught. The inner earth has multiple chambers, including the Garden of Eden, which is the Holy of Holies of Yahuwah. So that's righteous. That's not what we call a burning hell. Now, is it? It has chambers for the souls of the dead and at the bottom. Again, don't try to debate that here. We spend an entire series on that. Where do we go when we die? Watch it. Um, the lowest hell is Tartarus or Tartaru in Greek used by Peter, as specifically, Peter says, this fallen angel prison. You know, the one from Enoch, which Peter is quoting, hmm. or otherwise known in Greek as Gehenna, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is what we think of when we see the word hell. But the problem is, these two are different words, different connotations, different meanings. And these occur all on the day of judgment, the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, so fallen angels are imprisoned here in Tartarus with 90% of their Nephilim offspring. In fact, demons, their spirits are demons. That's the origin of demons. Yahuwah did not create them. Watch origin of demons. We cover that very well. Jubilees is specific. So is Enoch, really. However, there are no men there. The spirits of men do not go to a burning hell nor to heaven, for that matter, when we die. That's unscriptural. Uh, that's in a cult doctrine, once again, infused into the modern church, and really stupidly, because we don't need it. I mean, you know, we don't need to say that uh, Grandma or Lola is with Jesus in heaven when she dies. When she's not, it's a lie. Uh, when we could just say that she's in the chamber within the earth, her spirit is, her body, of course, returns to dust, as all bodies do, um, and she awaits the day of final judgment. I mean, that is just as, as nice, because she's still in the presence of Yahuwah, whose holy of holies is the chamber next to it called the Garden of Eden. It's pretty simple. Satan doesn't have the keys to the underworld. He's not there. Who has the keys to the underworld? Uh, we know from Revelation Yahusha said he has the keys to death and Hades, or the underworld, the general. Hades is a general term, as is Sheol, for the entire underworld, all of it. But watch where do we go when we die for more context there. Enoch is accurate to the whole of Scripture on that, and we cover a massive catalog of supporting Scripture, uh, including words from Messiah himself, Watch that and debate over there. Think you can watch one and try to debate? No, nope, not happening. We'll shut you down. Uh, we're just not going to placate ignorance. Sorry, no debating in ignorance on this channel. Watch, test, and learn. Questions are welcome. 
but agitation, which is a far cry different, will be muted. Our channel, our rules. In their publishing of the Books of Enoch, Scriptural Research Institute makes an interesting observation. Uh, no, we don't endorse them, and no, we don't agree with many things that they say. Let's be clear on that. Uh, when we use every reference that we use, it doesn't mean that we are then endorsing everything that person ever said. That's called stupidity, and we will not allow anyone to apply it here to us. Notice first, do a ding. Where Adam and Eve lived is defined as a wilderness, as is this Dudael. So they're both wildernesses. Uh, that's not enough to equate them within itself, though. Of course, there are other wildernesses on earth. But could they be the same? Is there an equation here? Well, they believe in the G's language. This translation was perhaps corrupted, which could be. And Dudael is the same word as Dudaim. Now, that could be, or Duda is the same for both, and one has the ending L for the angels, right? Because it's where the angels went, but it's still Duda, uh, and the other has Duda and then in. So you could look at it that way, and they're you know very similar in that sense. So you could see that there could be a corruption there, but it's not an exact direct corruption because one ends with L, one, one ends with in, uh, and no, we don't believe that those two would have been confused. But could it be the same place? Well, of course, their guess is, well, it's east of Jerusalem. Well, that's not founded in anything whatsoever. Uh, it has no basis, and that's the assumption that basically, uh, you know, Jerusalem is the middle of the earth, which is not scriptural in any sense. We covered that in the video, Middle of the Earth, so watch that. Uh, but where is this? Is Dudael the same land as Dudaim? Well, actually, there's a more logical way uh, we believe that very well could connect these two words, uh, and no surprise uh, if it was confused, at least some in G's, but check this out. Remember we covered when you find the land where Adam and Eve were exiled, uh, Havilah, that's what it's known as in Genesis 2, or Elda in origin was its name before the exile, according to the book of Jubilees, twice, and you will find the land of creation there. That's the name of the land of creation. It was originally named Elda, became Havila, named for Eve's curse in the garden. And then, of course, after the flood, when the patriarchs return, it became Ophir, Sheba, and Tarshish. Ground zero for creation. Wow. Elda. However, here's what makes sense even more so to us. The word Elda okay, and da el, well, appear to have merely been reversed in order here, which wouldn't change their meaning, by the way, uh, necessarily. And da el is elda, perhaps. Uh, same land of creation, same land of dudein, havila. But why would the angel open a hole in the earth there and seal it? Well, we know the Garden of Eden is directly underneath, right? Right, but specifically the area of Visayas. This is not going to be there, but close to it. Uh, and that's in the middle of the archipelago, okay? Um, again, we have well vetted and proven that is a match. But you will have to watch Solomon's Gold series, read the search for King Solomon's treasure to follow our full position on that. Uh, again, try to debate in ignorance a position you don't even know well and haven't reviewed. That's just disrespect. That's what that is. You will be muted. Our channel, our roles. However, if in fact this connection is accurate, then we should be able to locate something geographically or geologically uh, really that fits here. Well, this is incredible because we believe we do. It just so happens science has a find 
right here in the region of the Philippines. This is reported in Forbes magazine, but this is a scientific find from scientific journals. We just like the way that they cover it uh, because it's easier to cover in a YouTube video rather than all the scientific language. Duh. But of course, we know some will criticize. Let them have it. They'll just be muted anyway. Um, but this perfectly fits an archangel boring a massive hole into the earth and then closing it up. Hmm. One in which leads to, in fact, the burning hell of Tartarus at the bottom, which would even appear volcanic, at least at one time, even would look like an eruption took place. Gee, I wonder what it would look like if an angel created an opening in the earth, an archangel at that. Well, that's what it would look like. Now, maybe even as a massive explosion, it would appear, yet not necessarily what happened, but they don't know. They just make those assumptions uh, of a super volcano, right? Except, well, it didn't. And what they are looking at has no such proof. There's no evidence that super volcanoes even exist. Uh, this is the Benham Rise just to the east of Luzon Island, Philippines. Okay, so we're in Dudai right? Uh, just, just next to it. And here within, according to Forbes magazine, not us, and this is not some fabrication, uh, Forbes is reporting news here. Uh, they say the world's largest caldera, that's a hole in the earth that appears to have been created by a volcanic event, they will assume, but we know this is the likely place where Raphael drilled into the earth. Now, discovered in the Philippine Sea, just to the east of Luzon Island again. Again, this area was dry land before the flood. Remember that. So it was a desert or wasteland prior. Uh, both of these connotations, again, were wildernesses, deserts. Now, this shows you how ridiculous modern science goes into a realm of fiction and fairy tales because they make things up because their assumption is the only way something like this could happen is if it were a super volcano. Well, that's just because they can do the math, but that doesn't make them right, of course. Uh, and basically, in conclusion, this is a pit the archangel Raphael opened uh, and it was not created by a volcano. Now, that is more logical with a basis in historic fact. Think about it. They simply don't bother to educate themselves on real history. They ignore much of it, especially anything biblical. Willing ignorance, Peter called it. And that defines our age in academia and scholarship in the modern church. And it's insane, really, but it's there. The rock, they had no scientific uh, ability to date is supposedly, get this, 47.9. No, no, not 48, folks. No, no, no. It's 47.9 million years old. <laughs> I mean, they can't even round it up. That's when you see how they stretch these embellishments because they have to do that. I mean, no, it was 47.896735254327567. So there, right? Uh, no, because it's stupid to say the world is millions of years old, period. There is no basis for that scientifically whatsoever. They have observed nothing which would ever lead one to believe the earth could be that old, whether alone billions of years, which is their claim. And it keeps getting older and older and older throughout time. Imagine that. <laughs> and I don't mean a year older next year. I mean, it could be another billion years older, another five billion years. It's going to be, you know, quadrillions of trillions of trillions and billions and trillions of years older by the time they're done, because it's going to take that kind of embellishment to try to make the theory of evolution, which failed at its onset, even from the words of Charles Darwin, who admitted the fossil record did not support it, thus science doesn't support his theory, thus he doesn't even offer a scientific theory in the first place, and it still doesn't, by the way. Okay, then it goes to 26 million years. 
Oh, is that all? Okay, now, you got that, everyone? Do you notice the margin of error in this ridiculously stupid, unscientific measure? I mean, admittedly, almost 50%. Uh, that's their admission right there. 50% margin of error. Are you kidding? That is ridiculous. Can you imagine publishing a date and telling people you could be more than 20 million years off and call yourself a scientist? Really? Uh, that's not a range. It's called fiction. Again, they are unaware that this is the world's largest caldera. Why? Because this is is where the Archangel Gabriel opened the earth, cast the watchers inside, and sealed it up. Wow. How about that? It fits better than anything else. Because again, it's the largest on earth. Many of you have heard of the Yellowstone Caldera, another uh, claim of a supervolcano based on what? Based on the formation of the mountains and hills around it, uh, based on... Flood erosion, uh, duh, which they ignore. See, so they don't they don't take into account that that's all flood damage. But then they'll say, "Oh, well, that's a super volcano." <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, they've never proven that. And yeah, sure, they supposedly measure uh, within the Earth and claim that it has a pocket of magma, you know, this size by this size by this size. Yeah, right. Well, maybe that's true. You and I have never seen that. You haven't. And we've never seen evidence. And this is how modern science operates. They operate in this realm where they tell us things that they can't even prove. Therefore, these are unscientific in nature. These are religious in nature. Because a magma sea inside the earth is fitting to the Hades of Greek mythology, not the inner earth of the Bible. So, we haven't seen one under the Benham Rise. There's no evidence of volcanic, uh, you know, that that particularly has a volcanic pocket underneath of it. That's not there. Um, yes, there are in the Philippine Trench, which is the ancient Pisan River, but that's because those are the fountains of the great deep hydrothermal vents, we call them today, uh, that are within the ridge and trench system all around the earth. And that was actually the cause of the flood. Now, we covered that in Rivers from Eden. Uh, our theory, watch it, and it will blow your mind if you haven't. They are really trying to scare us with these super volcanoes. And I want to address this so everyone knows uh, which is a new concept on the scale and magnitude. Uh, if ever one does erupt, we challenge everyone to go back and test the aftermath. And you're going to find that the signs will likely be a man-made event. It seems that's what they're setting up. Who knows? There, Earth has no signs and no history of such extinction level events events except the flood itself there have never been any others uh there is no ice age didn't happen couldn't happen and all of that damage is their underestimation of the magnitude of the flood and its erosion uh, and its carving into mountains with mega uh, tsunamis etc they don't even know the narrative uh, because they run formulas trying to disprove what Christians are saying, saying, well, the earth couldn't possibly uh, in 40 days and 40 nights flood, or the friction would be so much that the water would, would uh, dissipate and the flood would be consumed. Well, you know, once again, the flood was five months, not 40 days and nights. That's stupid. They don't know the narrative. They can't bother to read the narrative. But see, neither does the church, and they get it from church scholars who can't read. So, why? Because they put their fingers in their ears and ignore over 300 worldwide flood accounts in antiquity among ancient cultures, as well as marine fossils found on every mountain range on Earth. I mean, that's a big duh, but they just ignore it. Couldn't possibly be, and they'll ridicule you for saying that. Yet, what's truth, what's fact, this is obvious. But of course, they think they're smarter uh, than, well, those barbarians. The very same logic they used, the same peoples, 
to rape, steal, kill, and destroy lands like the Philippines, for instance. Don't buy that trash. It is the most evil way to think, and Nephilim in origin. It's kind of like the theory of evolution. Again, already disproven. Um, you know, they'll find a uh, one little bone, one, a foot bone of a uh, what they call uh, Kaleo man from a cave. Notice all these bones come from caves. So their assumption is is that ancient man only lived in caves. That's stupid. That that's the Bible says otherwise. Number one. Um, but worse than that, um, they're lazy. See, they, they don't actually dig into the strata um, in uh, other parts of the earth. They go into caves, and they do it there pretty much, and that's where they find these bones. Uh, one must wonder if it doesn't have a little emblem on the bottom that says made in China, because China has... Uh, even dinosaur bone manufacturers. Um, yeah, just go look it up on Alibaba. They're there, and it's kind of weird that they have so many, but oh well. Um, but we don't know that. But here's what we do know. They find a, a small foot bone, a piece of a foot bone, uh, in the uh, Philippines, for instance. And they made this declaration that it's 67,000 years old, yet they don't have the equipment that could possibly date that number one, nor do they understand the pre-flood environment was completely different, uh, that that bone was submerged in water for about a year during the flood, meaning they can't date it and changes everything. Um, but more so, they don't even look at just simple scientific things like, you know, they'll say, oh, well, it's a new species. Really? Why is it a new species? Did you test its DNA and its DNA is different? Oh, no, we couldn't test its DNA. It, 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 you know, unfortunately. Okay, that's fine. Cut them some slack, right? Okay, then how do you make such a conclusion? Well, because it's smaller than an adult human bone. Oh, okay. Now, here's what they don't bother to ask. Okay, they, they supposedly date the bones, right, as to how long ago it lived. But what they don't know is, because all they have is a foot bone, right? They don't, they don't have a skull, and they don't have anything to really measure to determine and affirm any of the find. And uh, so when they look at it, they say, well, um, it must be a new species, Luzonensis. Well, that just sounds great, except for... Have you really not considered the age of that skeleton when it died? Uh, what if that was the bone of a child? They haven't even considered that. They also haven't considered that people lived 900 years before the flood, so they probably developed uh, at different rates as well, and likely, you know, you could be a smaller, what we would say a... Uh, you know, 12 year old child uh, in stature, even at the age of, say, 30. I, we don't know that, but the point is, they don't know that either, and they don't know the opposite either. But they draw a conclusion and put it in the press internationally. They found a new species when they prove nothing, and it's absolute ignorance. Ignorance completely. Now, it's neat that an old bone was found there. That's cool. And that's all they can say. We found an old bone that looks like it's human. Not a new species, because they can't say that. You know, so they're reckless. They're grossly negligent. Uh, that find comes from a university, by the way, uh, that, you know, it's committing fraud and propaganda. That's what it's doing. That is not a scientific uh, interpretation of anything. They are not scientists. They are propagandists. That's what they are. And it leads to propagating a religion, ultimately. Now, basically, when you look at all of this, this is a fit to the land where Raphael opened the pit, Elda, or Dudaim, or Dudael, all the same. Can we prove it? Not further than this. Uh, we, we can't. But uh, we will be, uh, well, looking into it further over time. Uh, we're not planning to dive down and dust for fingerprints to see if perhaps the archangel Raphael left fingerprints in the caldera. I mean, 
That would be their requirement. See, they set up a false paradigm, and then if you don't meet their false paradigm that no one could possibly meet, uh, then, then that can't be truth, right? Well, no, that's just called stupid. Don't let them set false paradigms for you in your thinking. All of this seems no coincidence to us. Again, we can't prove it out any further, but it seems likely, very likely and probable. Verse 7, this is still Yahuwah to the archangel Raphael. This is neat. And heal the earth, which the angels have corrupted, and proclaim the healing of the earth. Now, he's doing that in Yahuwah's name. Understand that. He doesn't have powers. He's not an occult figure. Um, it's Yahuwah who heals. In fact, that's what his name means. I'll show you. Uh, that they may heal the plague, and that all the children of men may not perish through all the secrets that the watchers have disclosed and have taught their sons. So what do these, what does the secret doctrine do of the watchers? It will lead to all the children of men perishing. And that's where we are to day. That is the prevalent theology of even much of the church, but of the world elite today. They think like Nephilim. Many have Nephilim bloodlines, but regardless of whether they do or not, or whether you can connect that, their ideology is that of the Nephilim from the golden age before the flood. Uh, you know, when the Nephilim ate your children, raped your wife, killing her in the process, uh, and then, you know, snapped you in half. Ah, the good old days. Don't we want those back, idiots? They don't even realize what they are asking for. They're uneducated and unlearned, yet they call themselves scholars and academics. Rafa and El, that's the name here, is very significant. This is the angel of healing. That is what Rafa means. His name means healing. Uh, his name also is El. Yahuwah, of course, in this case. That's what angels bear. They are of Yahuwah. Uh, so it's all about the, you know, the strength of Yahuwah or whatever of Yahuwah, not about them, them and their powers. Again, they're not occult beings. It is Yahuwah who heals. Um, and uh, indeed, he does. But he does it through this angel especially. That's his role. That's why Raphael was chosen here and also why we see him in the book of Tobit doing the very same thing. He's there to heal Tobit and his son uh, you know, or at least his, uh, deal with his son's, uh, issue with his, uh, future bride. So, um, that's one of his roles, and that's why he was used there. Verse 8, and the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel, the whole earth folks. This is clear. This is why the Bible says that every imagination of the pre-flood existence, every imagination of their heart was evil continually. All of them except for Noah and his sons and their wives. Um, yes, their wives as well were pure Seth bloodlines. We've proven that out uh, in the wives of the patriarchs. Uh, watch it. Uh, that's all there in the book of Jubilees very clearly. Uh, tracks the wives as well, which is awesome. Uh, so we know that there's no Cain in there, and there are no Nephilim in there. So just not there. But this is consistent with Genesis. And now you understand the context in full, which is what you get when you read Enoch and Jubilees as Scripture. Now we will come back and cover the Watchers and the Nephilim in the series, of course, uh, in detail. But let's continue. To him, Azazel, ascribe all sin. Wow. Now, this is fascinating. Uh, what's going on here? Well, he is the scapegoat. This is the origin of this concept, and even word, which Moses quotes as he quotes first Enoch. Moses quoted first Enoch multiple times, but this is indisputably one of them because you don't find this name anywhere else in the Bible. Imagine that. Now, all of the watchers were punished. Uh, it does appear Satan, though, joined them uh, in their aims, but clearly 
must not have defiled himself with women. There's no evidence of that, uh, even in the description of him. Uh, his name was Gadri L, it appears, and we're going to do a whole video on that, so we'll explain it. Uh, debate that here. Before we even created the video, well, be muted. Our channel, our rules. See, in Leviticus three times, three times, Moses identifies, uh, which translates as the scapegoat. Uh, but when you look at the word in Hebrew, the word is Azazel. Yeah, Azazel, the leader of the watcher fallen angels. The scapegoat, one and the same, just as we just saw in Enoch. Azazel is led out into the wilderness in the very same way. Because that's where Raphael opened up the earth, bound him, and threw him in, all the way down into Tartarus. Just as the original, Azazel was cast into the wilderness, this goat, basically, uh, symbolizes a similar thing. Not in Israel, which is not founded at all in any context in this. Uh, the goat was ascribed all sin just as Azazel, the fallen angel, was. This is not a new thing. Moses is quoting Enoch here. Uh, he knew this, and the mindset of the ancients is very clear. Now, the narrative is clear here. It continues as Gabriel participates in this, as does Michael, the archangels. Uh, but it was Raphael who made an opening in the earth, a massive one. Uh, imagine what an archangel could do. Uh, in order to cast Azazel and the Watcher Fallen Angels into the pit from the surface, the opening was made at the surface. The end point is the lowest hell, Tartarus, Gihana, whichever term you wish to use, uh, but all the same place. It's not hell in terms of Sheol or uh, Hades, which are general terms, though this is part of it. It's the very lowest portion of hell. That's the only place where there is burning. Uh, they await their judgment there to this day. It makes sense, though we cannot fully prove the location of Duda El. Uh, does appear to be the same as Elda, the land of creation. The same as Duda Ain, um, which is Havila, the land of Adam and Eve, where they were exiled to and where their generations would flourish up until the flood. It all fits. This is where the entrance to the garden is as well. And there is, uh, you know, the largest caldera on all of earth right there in the place that the Bible basically seems to identify here as the place where that archangel opened the earth and closed it back up. This is the same land where the entrance, the east entrance to the Garden of Eden, the only one, is... Uh, and this caldera, the largest on all of Earth, twice the size of Yellowstone even, which was uh, considered the largest before, uh, is you know a good ways uh, northeast of the garden, which could not extend that far as there are oil pockets in between uh, sandwiching the garden in. Uh, it certainly appears. We mapped those out, uh, explored the rough shape of the garden, uh, in Solomon's Gold series, parts 12 and 13, it's right there. Uh, again, read the search for King Solomon's treasure, free in ebook at ophirinstitute.org. Uh, and our position is very firm, very clear, and no one has touched it in over five years. Not a single coherent challenge to these findies, findings and conclusions. We have over 400 videos on this channel. One for every day of the year now. Many just as profound, with some 50 or so in Tagalog for Filipinos. And now six in Spanish to start. We also have been setting up subtitles for 20 plus languages for most of our videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new uploads. Join our email list as YouTube fails to notify often. And we will notify you ourselves at thegodculture.com. And just fill in the pop-up there. Understand that if YouTube, a lot of people fear that this will happen, and who knows, maybe it will. Uh, we, we don't believe it will, but you never know. Um, if for some reason they try to take our channel down illegally, which it would be illegal, uh, then uh, our recourse is, is we'll continue to make videos uh, and we'll house them on our website and other servers. 
and uh, they'll still be available, but we'll be able to notify you. Uh, so make sure we have your email address or some way to get in touch. Uh, we now have alternative platforms for videos uh, as well on Rumble, Odyssey, and Utreon. Uh, and our new podcast is also available on just about every major platform uh, from Apple Podcasts to Google Podcasts to uh, even Alexa, uh, you know, uh, pretty much all the Spotify, all the major servers, pretty much we're there. Um, but go to our website and you can find that. Uh, and all links are in the description box. Friend us on Facebook at The God Culture, space hyphen space original. If you prefer an alternative to Facebook, we now have Parlor link below. We now have six books published internationally, being read in over 100 countries. With our new release now available, the first book of Enoch, the oldest book in history. And we prove it. Read the introduction. We also have now launched Ophir Philippines Coffee Table Book in the U.S., Canada, U.K., and many overseas markets on Amazon. And it is available in hardcover or softcover there. We've had that in hardcover in the Philippines all along. Uh, additionally, we launched the Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar, with color maps now and interior. Um, as uh, so many have requested and uh, we didn't have overseas, we have that in the Philippines already, uh, but on Amazon it's available in hardcover or softcover if you wish. The black and white is still there too. And the same for First Enoch. It's all there uh, on Amazon uh, in hardcover, softcover, uh, both in color uh, or in black and white. Uh, or you can get it on Shopee Philippines and again all books, including Solomon's Treasure, are free in ebook. Our content is free, folks. Just go to OphirInstitute.com for all the links for your area for all of our books. More coming soon. Thank you for watching. Now, always remember prove all things for yourself. Yah bless to everyone. Thank you.